you're familiar with Glory Allred. You know mm-hmm. who Glory yeah, Allred yeah. is? Okay. Yeah, yes. So, you know, sometimes, you know, we are sold a philosophy by somebody who has had dramatic life experiences that we haven't had, right. but they impose their philosophies onto you, and you kind of sit there and say, I'm going to buy that. But you shouldn't buy that because it may not work for your life. It's extra- But because the other person is such a better salesperson, it's so much emotion into it, you buy into it, right? You got to be very careful which philosophies of people you buy. So I remember when I interviewed her, Gloria Allred, we're in her office, I walk in, and, you know, she, she's a perfect, like, she's the, for people that don't know who Glory already is, how do you define who she is? Well, she's a Michael uh, Jordan Tyler. of sexual yeah. harassment lawsuits, Law- lawsuits, right? Can yeah. we say that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Attractive, older woman, accomplished. By the way, I had the most incredible mm-hmm. time sitting down with her when the interview was done, because things got heated. When the interview was done, I said, can I hug you? She says, you know what, Patrick? All you have to do is ask. That's the key. <laughs> yep. I'm like, okay. Uh-huh. So she gave me the biggest hug. Mm-hmm. We laughed it out. But I pushed her, she pushed me. I said, look, Gloria, you talk about feminism and women's rights and all this stuff. How many people you got working here? A lot. Why is it that the front desk clerk was a woman, but all your partner's pictures on the wall, they're all men? Well, well, well are you, how about you, Patrick? Are you not a bigot? It was like such an interesting dynamic. Yeah. But then I said, I want to find out about this later. lady. Mm-hmm. When I looked at her documentary, looked at study stuff on her, when she was in Cancun, do you know the story about what happened to her in Cancun no. in Mexico? So when she was younger, in her early uh, mid-20s, very attractive girl, she goes to a doctor, she meets a doctor, doctor Terry says, let's go back to my practice, I want to show you my office. In the office, she, he, she, he rapes her, okay? And she keeps it to herself for a while, but she creates this level of anger towards men, right? So later on, she gets married. Uh, to this man, then they get a divorce. I think after she gets a divorce, uh, you know, he ends up committing suicide. The guy kills himself, her first husband. And then second husband, she gets married. They get a divorce. She keeps the last name, but sues the hell out of him. Mm-hmm. And you saw what happened to her daughter. Her daughter is now kind of similar doing what she's doing. I don't know if you're following the fo- She's following her footsteps. Similar personality, strong personality. And she's out there saying, independent woman, independent woman, independent mm-hmm. woman, independent woman. And women are like, she's right, she's right, she's right. Mm-hmm. And it may work for some, but some actually do want to have a family, do want to have, oh, you yeah. know, do want to have a husband, do want to stay, you know, build something together with them. How do you differentiate between, you know, somebody who is selling a bag of goods that maybe worked for her because she had a painful experience? Mm-hmm. How do you process that? How do you get somebody who is listening to this saying, well, she's right, mm-hmm. versus saying, I don't know if that philosophy is going to work for me long term. It's it's very difficult to make a rational argument with people who are like seated and steeped in emotionalism. And anger is definitely an emotion and resentment and, and, uh, you know, (sighs) regret, um, revulsion. There's all kinds of Mm -hmm. different emotions that go along with that. So I can be the most rational guy in the world and say, here's the statistics. Here's here's the the dynamics. Here's just the dots that I'm connecting. I'm not going to change that person's mind if we're if. If she's having an emotional argument and I'm having a rational argument because we're talking past each other, um, my most people, when they have a, a conflict of interest or they have like, oh, you, you believe in a philosophy. And I'm like, no, I don't believe in a philosophy. I believe in empirical data. Here it is. Uh, the only way they can win that uh, that rational argument is by converting it into an emotional argument. And that's, in a, in a nutshell, kind of what happens when you're trying to relate um, red pill awareness when you're trying to relate the kind of material that I do to people who are very ego invested into like their personalities are dependent on that belief set. So unless they get to a point of crisis, unless they get to a point of, of really kind of desperation or they have, you know, through some miracle, they have some sort of insight about things. You're really probably not going to uh, change their minds about it. The best you can do is to present, you know, pick your battles, uh, ask, uh, lead the witness, right? Ask uh, pertinent questions at the time when those when those topics arise. Um, but as far as like when we're talking about like this n- cultural narrative of the power in uh, strong, independent yeah. woman right now, it's practically a brand. We've been talking about the strong, independent woman since 1970, since Gloria Steinem. OK, and. Why is that a broken philosophy? Why well, is that a broken it's a, it's a broken philosophy for, for several reasons. Because some people, some people okay. swear by it. Independent of what? What are women independent of? Men. They're independent of men's provisioning. So when we go back, remember I told you how everything goes back to the micro? Yeah. <laughs> the micro level is this. 
For women, women's mating strategy is hypergamy, okay? And I mean that on two fronts. It's dual. It's not just one. Like mm -hmm. a lot of people mistake hypergamy as, oh, well, women marry up. It's not just about that. Women also are looking for short-term sexual genetic benefits. They want the hot guy in the foam cannon party in Cancun on spring break. You know, they want the hot fireman that arouses them and gets their blood boiling. And then they want the guy who's also, like I said, attraction, who is the guy who's a good long-term security prospect. So it's cads versus dads. That's the that's kind of like the dynamic that women have to choose. They have to find the mm -hmm. best fit between yeah. those two things. In today's society, really since 1970, we have developed a, a social order that has told women, you don't need to worry about long-term security. We've got, we've got no-fault divorce. We've got uh, child support laws. We've got uh, the Duluth model of feminism. We've got uh, more women in the workplace. I just go on down the line of all the benefits that, have, that women have accrued since the time of the sexual revolution. All of those point to one thing, which is long-term security for women. So when we're talking about like abortion on demand, that's a fail safe for bad reproductive choices. That is the function of abortion is to say, you know what? Well, I, 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 he's not, I don't want, he's not a good prospect for the future, but this guy is. And so therefore we have that option. Just having that option is that is exactly why women will fight tooth and nail to keep abortion legal. That's number one. You think that's the reason? Absolutely. That is the function of it. So people, women will say, well, it's because of, yeah, uh, Im, you know, bad to say, what, really, what, what else is it? I mean, is it, is it, uh, uh, is it bad philosophy? Is it bad religion? Is it bad so whatever? What so let's process what, what so is what, the, what is the is, purpose? What is the latent purpose So what purpose you're saying is, what you're saying is if, if a girl hooks up with an NFL player, she'll mm -hmm. keep the baby. But if she hooks up with a, you know, neighbor, because mm -hmm. one night she was alone and he came, he was a school teacher, regular guy. Mm -hmm. She may abort that baby, but keep yes. the NFL. And That's what you're saying. And it's exactly why you have no seat at the table when we start talking about abortion laws. You don't have a uterus and therefore you don't get to, you don't have a say. Mm -hmm. You know what NFL trained on that, by the way, just a side note, mm -hmm. NFL trained that every time you have sex with a condom, uh, uh, flush the flush the condom. It was the NBA, NBA that yeah. uh, did that. Too. I mean, well, now now it's everybody. Have you seen what happened recently in the news in the tabloids with Drake yeah. and the hot sauce and the condom right. situation? You know where he got that from was Tom Likas from back in the ninth. Because I did 90s, I did yeah. a segment on that. And everyone's like Tom Likas, Tom Likas. Who the hell yes. is that? Tom Likas. Yes. <laughs> My question is like Drake, why are you putting Cholula sauce in a freaking condom? Just flush it down mm -hmm. the toilet. I don't know if it was an environmental it was, issue or whatever. Um, I believe but, it was 2001. The NBA released a press release to all their players who were on road trips because they had such a high incidence of women that they were sleeping with while they were on road games. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, uh, they would use a condom and the women would, uh, let's say, inseminate themselves with the leftovers in the condom so that they could have a kid with an NBA player. Of course. So, that is a goal of many and of the It was so common there. that they had to make a press release for that. And of course, Tom Like is being the extreme guy who has, you know, this is, well, you should put Tabasco sauce in there. So like when she does that, <clears> she'll uh, get But, but continue. You were saying, continue. You, you, mm -hmm. you, you were going to a point there. What's okay, feminism so, movement so and why it's not an effective strategy? Okay, abortion. So, so there, yeah. and that's just one, one factor that goes along. And so what we have done is we've established a social order where men are unnecessary. And women today will say this. We don't need men. We're starting I don't need no man. I don't need no man, but I want a man. Okay. What man do you want to get with? What man is that? It's usually the guy who's the quote unquote stereotypical alpha Chad guy, hot guy in the foam cannon party. She wants the alpha seed side of hypergamy, not the beta need side, because at least there's this idea that that side of security, that side of her mating strategy is going to be settled. And when they get to the point where they're 33, 34, 35 years old, and they're asking me, Rolo, where are all the good guys? How come I can't find a guy who is, you know, makes more money than me or is, is ready to go yeah. forward? They're all so irresponsible. They're all threatened by powerful, strong, powerful women. And the only answer I have for them is you have created yourself into the man that you wanted to marry. Mm -hmm. And so when, when women hit me up and they ask me about this and they say, OK, well, what can I do? What can I do to be uh, to to find a long term uh, a long term guy? And they're 34, 35 years old, and these, they get very, very frustrated. Mm. They're like, I'm, I guess I'm going to die alone. You know, I guess that, that they've resigned themselves to, to you know, being a, a spinster, let's just An say. An old spinster, exactly. And so what I say is, well, you know, what are the men uh, that you're looking for? What are they looking for in a woman? Well, they're looking for femininity. They're looking for a woman who's hot. They're looking for sexual availability. They're looking for a woman who can nurture, who might be a good mother in the future. I mean, there's all of these sort of conventional feminine qualities that they don't embody anymore. And so when they say, well, what do I got to do? I got to play dumb. I got to play the ditzy blonde. I've been told my whole life that I needed to be in charge and powerful and everything else. And as, as, uh, as Patrick was saying just a minute ago, 
is women want to be, or they, they believe that they need to be in those positions of power because they can't depend on a man. Men are irresponsible. Men are untrustworthy. Men, like Gloria Allred, for example, uh, I, I don't need no man, or they have a very uh, misandrous uh, attitude towards guys as a result of life experience or whatever. But it doesn't even have to be something as dramatic as that. It can be simply like watching Disney Pixar movies that do nothing but say, you can do anything. You can be an astronaut and have babies at the same time. Time. And you can, you know, be in the military and fight wars and you can go and be a computer, whatever it is, you know, the sky's the limit, girl. And you have, you know, three, four generations of women who are raised on that. They b believe that they have to be the one who provides that security for themselves. So as a result, you have careerist women who are getting more degrees than men. We, we constantly we, we point at men when we talk about this, but let's look at the stats here. There are more women who are enrolled in college. There are more women in doctorate programs. There are more women who uh, get master's degrees. Um, I mean, just educationally yeah. speaking, we can we can you know, parse that out. Women are making more money than than men are these days, or increasingly more, anyways. Um, and then women spend more money. That that is part of the family unit. Right now, ninety percent of of uh, American homes, the woman is the one who makes all of the the big economic decisions for those homes. So it's not necessarily earning capacity or this wage gap kind of thing. It's who is making the spending, who's doing the who's who holds the purse strings. And we can see that on the family level, and you can also see that on the societal level as well. So if you go look at the, who's in charge of the IMF right now? Who's in charge of the, the Fed? Who's in charge of the, uh, with the EMF Janet right Yellen, now? Janet Yellen, you're saying? Well, yeah, you look at, I think it was on Zero Hedge, had, the, had a really great story about this. Is like, the world's economies are now controlled by women. So if you enjoyed this little short segment from the podcast that we did, here's another short segment to watch. Or if you want to see the entire podcast, click over here. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.